Hello, in Mexico, and we are talking to Jose Davia in our 10 a.m. series. Um, so um, we try to speak with different participants in the art world, artists we represent, but also curators, museum directors, collectors. Uh, we do the open call series, um, which we did today, which was amazing, um, really amazing interesting different um, artists joining. So let me see if we find Jose. I don't see him yet, but probably he's coming any second. So, or oh, am I too early? No. Um, and Jose is an artist we represent since quite some time. He just had the big exhibition upstairs and the work um, traveled actually from upstairs to the garden and we see it here and we're gonna ask him about it and here we are second otherwise Jose has your comments in his face and at the end uh, of our conversation we open up to questions hello how are you hello doing? Johan nice to how see are you, you? Good to see you. Great to be here. How's everything? Good to see you too. Uh, oh, well, you in Guadalajara? Uh, somehow okay. Yeah. No, I am actually in in a town two hours away from from where I live, in the mountains. And and how how is the situation in Mexico? I I, I keep on seeing this funny funny comments. Uh, I mean, actually, not so funny that Mexico uh, urges Trump to hurry up with a, with a wall. <laughs> well, actually, it wouldn't be bad, but in a reverse way, because now we wouldn't have the influx of all the people that is flying from the U.S. into Mexico to avoid, yeah. to avoid the pandemic there, which I'm sure it will create a great havoc because our government is not dealing with the situation in any real responsible way. Their messages have been very mixed up. Now they're finally getting it, but I think we're going, we're running late. So just, let's just hope for the best. But do you have tests in, in Mexico? Because you hardly have tests there, in the US, I think, still. Very, very few, hardly nothing, basically. So. I believe the numbers of people infected in Mexico are are a really misconception because very few people get t tested. So mm -hmm. I think they're not real, real, you know. And and how's the impact? Um, uh, because like here in Germany, the schools are home. Uh, all schools are closed. Kindergarten is closed. Um, uh, here nobody nobody it's all empty you know there's no uh, nobody at the gallery anymore yeah. um i mean I, I i think even it's forbidden to open uh, we opened early before it was a law to close and um uh -huh. and it's i think you're maximum allowed on the street with two more people uh i forgot now if it's two yeah. people uh, or you plus one uh, plus two i forgot and and you have to be in the same household and so on and how is it in Mexico? Is your, uh, your daughter's home, no school, everything is shut down? Yes, Every, everything is, uh, basically everything is shut down. Uh, the schools are, uh, the kids are doing home office at least until the 30th of May, like for the whole month, at least, wow. upon until like uh, maybe something new. And all like uh, restaurants, bars, Non, what they call non-essential activities are also closed. Basically just, you know, uh, groceries, pharmacies, and certain kind of industries. But you can still go out in the street and there wouldn't be any problem at all. So it's quite confusing. And because restaurants? a lot of people is not paying attention. Yeah. Restaurants are closed. Yes. Yeah, I find it very. I mean, it's it's it. I find it so interesting that that it that we all share this. You know, if it's Australia, Mexico, um, I mean, it's also a, a very weird thing of unity. 
uh, on some yes, it, 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 it's a it's a weird um, it's a weird result of globalization, in which suddenly, no matter where which country you're from, the basic core experience of distancing and of having to find like a, a very different way to dwell every day is shared by everyone. No. And how was it for you? I mean, we had a project planned for Art Basel Parkour, which is uh, pushed to September now. Um, actually, it's like these um, yeah. these elements here. Um, maybe you can talk about a bit uh, uh, about it a bit. So we have like two concrete cubes, and then is this a, a volcano? It's a it's a lava yes. rock, no? Yes, you know it's. Uh... Basically, um, rocks come out of um, tectonic moves, either uh, fire, also explosions, or compression. Uh, I like to use the different stones for their symbolic power, but I like in the sculptures to address the, let's say, invisible but very powerful fact of the force of gravity, which I always like to include Uh, as a variable in the equation of a sculptoric making. Uh, because in this sense, all the elements are working together to withstand the, the force of gravity. And therefore, I, I understand concrete somehow as a, as a rock that humans created, and therefore as opposed to, 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 the, to the lithic aspect of stone, which is a temporal, And is completely um, is completely uh, ancient. It's a uh, it's the most primitive, let's say, the most primitive element in which humans ever built with, either to create something holy for them, like let's say a stone hedge, or yeah. then to create any kind of shelter. So I like to interpose these two elements. So, but it, maybe the piece actually is a bit too much in the corner. I must, I must admit now, because I think it's very important to see, to see this element here. That this is like, this is like leaning way over. Uh, <laughs> you see, I do everything for the arts here. So this is like leaning. This one is is yes. is like up in the air, <laughs> that's, and, that's a... and 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 yes. and and this one is counter. The the stone is counterbalancing it. So like if. Yeah. If we would take the, if we would here here it's kind of more more visible. If we would take the stone away, exactly. Actually, now that would... you that you now that you mention it, I have to agree that I think it will be better if it's a bit farther from the corner, because yeah. yes, in fact that that kind of um, let's say a structural strategy. Is what they call like a, a cantilever, and then obviously yes, you always need the counterweight with with the stone. So so I mean, from uh, here I also like good. the relationship between how volume does not always imply a certain weight. But yeah. here, from here, yes, from here, it, it looks good. But I think actually yeah. it would be interesting to turn it around so that the free corner of the big cube is in this direction. And the stone uh -huh. leans to the other one, you know, it's kind of irritating, but, but, you know, and this is, I must say, I really like about this new situation. When would you and I come to this point to have this, ex this communication? I mean, you know, we are, we are social distanced by, by, uh, by nature because you live in Mexico and I live in Berlin, you know, so we only get to see each other when you, when, when we see each other on art fairs, I think like this. So. So, yeah. um, so there, there is an advantage somehow. And, but maybe what you just said also makes it a bit more clear. We did this, we did this König souvenir, um, two scarves. Actually, I mean, this is for, I, this is something I was so surprised by, you know, the soccer issues. This was a big issue here in, in, in Germany because, because they had to shut down the games, you know, and then they were, yeah. They, first, they, 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 uh -huh. there was a big dispute in the Bundesliga that some clubs continued doing the, the games, and then they had to do the games without the, without the uh -huh. audience until one of the Bundesliga players infected himself. The public. And, 
yeah. and and uh, because you played here so this is a sentence it says force is equal to the change in momentum yeah what yeah that change yes. in time it's one of the it's one of the very famous and celebrated three basic laws of uh, of newton and my main idea with the souvenir was actually what it's always been one of the of the goals uh, of science divulgation which is to try to portray their message into a, a common stream of communication so why like i was i was thinking how could i make this scarf which can be used as a scarf obviously but also when fans in football stadiums they tend to open the scarves to like give a message because they are part of that team then they would be in a way embedding a uh, science knowledge into the public realm was that that the, the main idea of also doing two scarves Uh, in the colors of two very popular football teams in Germany, no? Uh, this is Bayern, Bayern Munich, Europe. yeah, and this is uh, uh, Borussia Dortmund. But are Borussia you a soccer Dortmund. fan? Uh, yes, I am. And and but are these clubs known outside? Bayern Munich, I think, is very known outside. But yeah. but is Borussia Dortmund also so known outside Germany? I is think, it known in Mexico? I think, I think they are the two most known teams in Mexico from the German oh, yeah. Bundesliga. Yeah. Uh, and, and and then this the, the both um uh both sentences are for Newton's uh, uh famous laws. So I mean I would be very delighted if with this gesture suddenly I can find this kind of science divulgation inside of a football crowd in a stadium. It's like sneaking in a piece of science into the everyday life. But it's also kind of funny because it's, it's a lot of energy created there, right? In these... Um, yes. Uh, and which one do you like better? I like this one better. Uh, For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, yes, that's a very... In a, in a way, that's a very... One of the very, very famous... Uh, Newton loss, no? I, I, I really like what you say about how in the in the crowd, in the stadiums, there's a lot of energy created. And somehow also, you know, the fans, they do kind of create within their team this uh, mass and energy that goes back and forward. So there's a lot of relations going up uh, in between the game, the quantity of fans, And what the scars are talking about. You I know, guess you, you know, can apply, obviously, science to everything, no? Yeah, but you know, I, I find this sentence here very philo philosophical, but I, I had a very interesting experience with soccer. I took my oldest son to soccer games, and we, we often went here to Hertha, uh, to the Olympic Stadium, and then at some point, we both figured out that I went with him because I thought he would like it, and he went with me because he thought I would like it. You know, so we both did it for the sake of spending time together and in <laughs> exactly. fact didn't, both of us didn't really care for. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's too far away anyway too, because Olympic Stadium, has this, <laughs> you don't see anything. And I, but I, I thought always most men go there because they can sing. You know, it's like because they all, everybody sings together. Yeah, exactly. and, and, and how is this whole lock-in situation? Uh, um, uh, because you're very, uh, I mean, you, you are a conceptual artist, like this piece you did here where you, where you had the blocks spread out all, or it's also in our magazine here. Um, uh, uh, maybe yeah. you can explain, uh, because it, it, this was a conceptual piece, huh? right? Yes, yes. That, that, that piece was made for the PST Trenale in Los Angeles. Uh, um, like a year and a half, two, year, uh, two years ago, because it's funded for over a year, which was funded by the Getty, the Getty Institution in, in L.A. And I really was trying to address how can you do one sculpture that at the same time is many. It's about the, the concept of uh, unity. 
if uh, if unity can be somehow diluted and still be one, because this cube is formed by 40 different small pieces, which started as a whole in a park in LA, uh, uh, near uh, North Hollywood. And then they got disseminated throughout the whole, the whole city. And people would actually just see them as a bench to sit down, as a, as a game in the park for kids. Actually, that, was, that piece was outside of the, of, the, of the Marciano collection, so it was seen as a sculpture. But they all had their own different life. And they were a device that captured the street art of LA because obviously they were all graffited, painted on. They all got somehow transformed through the more or less 10 months. They were all around LA and they were a fractal of what LA is as a city. It's many cities and at the same time is one city. So the sculpture was not only a formal object, but it was also a device as a sponge that tried to capture over the time all the different parts of what LA is as a city. And, and when they came I, together, I, it became a mosaic, right? Yeah, it was like a... Yes. And, and when they came together back after 10 months, then in a way, it's like a three-dimensional mural of the streets of LA. Because if you keep opening these different uh, uh, pieces of the cube, they will all have inside different kind of graffitis, murals, paintings, all the people that did to them, relating to them. So, so it was very much about also the social interaction and creating social interaction through the object. And and how was it for you for you now in in um, in your in your in your practice right now? I mean, how do you uh, you you find time to work artistically anyway? Are you making drawings well, or? Yes, it's it's a it's a it's obviously a bit challenging because I am I am very much based in a tradition of empirical working in the studio. I do like to obviously have ideas to the part from, but then I also like to let intuition just come into play as I'm working with the studio, with the ecosystem of objects I have around. And then that like takes me to some places I didn't plan beforehand. I'm finding hard for that part, but it's also good to take a rest. And at the moment I'm actually just working on the sketches of things I would like to do when I go back to the studio. And then trying to see if the sketches take me somewhere else that I'm not uh, planning. So I'm doing some also, sketches every day. But you also work a, a little bit like because your project, it, you had a big show at the Dallas Contemporary, which turned out, uh, which just closed, I think, no? Yes, well, actually they, they did extend it because it was difficult to put a, to put a new show on. So it actually got extended, but now for the moment it's temporarily closed. Yeah. It was supposed to finish by the end of February, and now they extended it until May, but it's closed now. And then yesterday we talked to Simon from the NGV in Melbourne, and he talked about your work in the in the in the Biennial, and he said I didn't, I wasn't aware of this. You have two spots there. Yes, that's correct. Maybe I you can tell us a bit about it. Yes, of course. Um, I I got to work at Kakatu Island, which is an island in the Sydney Harbour, which in the Second World War used to be where they built all the ships and submarines. And it has a long history even before that, because it was originally uh, uh, a jail, you know, a prison. So it got listed as a historical uh, heritage site. And therefore, everything in the island is considered to be heritage. So I wanted to work site-specific and address the very notion of heritage, trying to make people realize heritage is often a concept we associate always with older and very important things and objects, 
But actually, I wanted to address that with the everyday. So I went to the island for about two weeks, just walking around and picking up different objects I found on my walkings, basically different kinds of, uh, of trash and junk, different objects that were used for something else in the island before, uh, but they were discarded. So I wanted to use this symbolic power of the elements and give them a second life. And I arranged all these objects in different plinths to, to address an idea of like a, an archaeological museum of the site, but of uh, contemporary archaeology, of everyday archaeology. Mm -hmm. And in the, in, the second, in the second site, I work upon my, my most recognizable line of work that puts my, interestings, my, my interests always into play about precarious balances, working with sheets of glass to try to portray this fragility, counterweighted with objects I found on the island as well. It's mm -hmm. the first time I counterweight, not with stones, but rather mm -hmm. with objects that were piece of, uh, of, 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 the, of the harbor of the island, for example. Like found metal rods I, I saw, right? <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which is, uh, as you are showing now, which is something I did in that project in, the, in, in two Havana Biennales ago, and the Carpinteros studio, which I work with objects I found in that house. Because I Is knew it? in Cuba, I couldn't just be working with, with, with whatever material I wanted. So I had to adapt to the, to the conditions. Here, and this is the piece, uh, this was the first exhibition with, with our gallery. And these are three giant marble plates, which are holding each other only by hanging. Uh, it's like, a, it's called joint effort, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so this one hangs in the in the strings as with this one as well as this one. So it's like it's like they all um, relay on each other. So if you if you would push this one to way to, if you if you irritate uh, the the um, the balance, uh, then they fall. And it's each one is a ton, right? Yes, yes, more more or less a little bit less than a ton. Uh, and here you see and, this is the middle the center. Yes. And it's so beautiful because you see and they come you straight. Know, you, you didn't treat them, right? You, you just, uh, the, the, the markings are from the stone uh, company. Yes, I just got them just as they are. Yes, those markings normally are to, to know where the stone is coming from, which part of the mountain, which, which quality of the marble. So I found, that, I found that to be a beautiful piece of communication that's embedded in the marble. And I also like to remember, like, you know, when this kid's game, when you hold hands with two other kids, oh, yeah, and yeah. you let yourself lean to, towards your back, and everyone does the same at the same time, so no one falls. And, and I think that's very symbolic for the times we are living now, in which we, we all need to help each other in order to survive this pandemic sort of thing. Like, I, I like the symbolic part of that sculpture that, It's um, aesthetically um, uh, one very objectual work, but then it does have a lot of layering in the social on how every object needs needs the other objects to survive. That's why that's why it's called joint effort, no? And two, I found two marble inter slabs will always be more heavy than one. I, I found very interesting in, in, in talking about the exhibition upstairs that all these stones, of course, they're millions of years old, right? And I yes, found interesting yes, that especially collectors were concerned about the long longevity of these strings, but uh -huh. also this plastic probably will be as old as the stone is. Yes, you I know, mean, that, like... that, that plastic, since it's, uh, it's synthetic, it, it would last for... You name it, yeah. You name it. So let's let's have a look outside also uh -huh. at your. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It was just the sub uh, the the subconscious that I took the red one. So because I wanted to, I don't know if you've seen it. I think you weren't. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to give it another look. So these sculptures, they don't you don't define them to be inside or outside, right? It's it's. 
and they can they can be inside or out. you can hear me I did finish architecture with a with my degree and everything but I never worked as one it's 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 a funny idea of like I got trained as one but I've been working only and professionally as an artist for 20 plus years never it's, it's, never done uh, any architecture actually and did do you give your stones names because we we visited I have a her studio here. Sorry? Yes. And and, and No, I you... don't Yes, I don't give I don't give a I don't give names to my stones. I I I I I, I don't uh but I do have some stones that I relate to very personally when I was building my house I had a stone where I used to sit on top of always to see the plants. And now I brought the stone into my own living room and it's always there because I developed certain kind of emotional attachment to it. <laughs> and do you <laughs> prefer, back, what background do you prefer for your sculpture? Like how do you feel about these, this situation here with the stones? Or do you prefer white cube? Well, I think um, it really does depend on which sculpture But um, but sometimes you know the outside is always a beautiful a beautiful contest context surrounding monolithic sculptures. Uh, sometimes, like nature, actually plays a big part around them. Uh, where does the interest for the industrial material come from? Belts and hooks, I guess. Yeah, that's a good question because when I was originally bringing stones into my studio. We had to put them on a on a certain kind of pallet and then lock them with the ratchet straps in order to transport them. So in a way, the, the hooks and the belts came into my studio organically. They were not uh, originally uh, 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 something I chose aesthetically or uh, conceptually. Yeah. They were mm -hmm. rather there. So it was more a moment of actually uh, being being present in time and and seeing that they somehow already form they already form part of my sculptures and then I like how to address them as part of the technology as opposed to the primitiveness of the rock so it's it's a way of uh, introducing technology and the development of technology into the sculpture. And, and, and it's ready-made, or do you order the colors of, the, of it? Uh, I order the colors now. It was uh, ready-made in the beginning, and then I found like really good, lasting hooks with a special company that takes the lettering out of the hooks, because I thought that would give like a different narrative that I was not looking for. I only care for them for what they do structurally, And then I like to choose the color as a, as a drawing in space sometimes as well, as addressing the relation with different stones or different volumes. How many people help you do, to do these installations? Well, it depends on the amount of machinery we have at hand to be able to lift certain things, but between four to six people, more or less. Uh, I didn't go to art school either. So how did you approach galleries? Because I saw your show uh, really, uh, that was an amazing show. I don't know how many years ago in Mexico. I was there for the art fair. I showed uh, it. Yeah, that was 2014. I think the show yeah. you're talking about must be 2014. And how Mexico did you, City. it was OMR, right? Yes. Well, actually, I didn't approach galleries uh, myself I started I, I met actually a curator called Guillermo Santa Marina while I was still studying um, architecture because I used to share a studio in which I had a black room a, a dark room of photography 
with a painter and other two people that were doing some uh, art and and even though I was studying uh, architecture and this curator um, was interested in what I was doing invited me to do a couple of shows which I met another curators and other fellow artists we continued doing some shows and then in one of these shows I was approached by one gallery to do a gallery show and one thing led to another. So I think it was more about uh, creating independent shows to be able to to put into practice what you do. And but it's interesting let... because because it I, it I think it was this show here, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and it's interesting because when I saw the show, I was so impressed by it. And of course, as you clearly can see, it's not really commercial, you know. So it's no. like um, it's pretty radical. Um, and it was this like old old Mexican house, and then all these big plates like lean into it, and and but it's interesting because it wasn't really like the 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 Mexican. There was this wave about like twenty years ago, or eighteen years ago. You you came after, right? You were not so in this. Yes, I am. I am for a, from a younger generation. Let's say, um, I mean, I mean, I was I was in the in the show that Klaus Wiesenbach curated at the Kunstwerke, which was also at PS1, about Mexico City. I was part of that show, but I, but I was the younger one, the youngest one in the show. Yeah. Um, and in a way, I guess my approach has been from a different uh, generation is less... Uh, let's say folklorically Mexican in that sense, but rather I try to, I like to work more uh, in universal terms of uh, art making. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, uh, sometimes people ask me like, why is your art not so Mexican? And I always say, well, what, what is that? I don't know. That's, why that's are there no tacos in the sculptures? <laughs> like, <what are> they? <laughs> I mean, in Germany, you know, we have to also have all the time worst. Uh, Maybe I can counterbalance a, a, a volume with a sombrero. <laughs> <laughs> and how much is the balance important? How much is the balance important in your sculpture? Well, it, it, it's very. It's, I think it's very important because that helps me to 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 take the decisions that then are not merely aesthetical. I like, for example, that some rocks needs to be of a certain size and weight, for example. So that's already determining the aesthetical quality of the sculpture, but it's actually funneled through the idea of balance. So, so balance, I think it's a fundamental element in, in, in the sculpture I, I do. Um, it really does affect the final out outcome. And uh, what is the starting point of your work? Uh, sketching, yeah. 3D software? Yes, no, I do, I do sketching as where the main, the main principle of the sculpture is somehow created in the sketching. But I do tend to collect a lot of stones and then I build uh, concrete volumes and glass and all different kinds of objects that I have in my studio without exactly knowing what am I going to use them for. I say they are like my ecosystem of objects. So once I, I have the sketch, I go into the studio and I start moving things around, kind of stacking, moving, putting, taking away. And then I start to encounter necessities as I go along. And then I try to solve these necessities with whatever I have at hand. And therefore, that's the empiric uh, part of the, of the process. Sometimes I use uh, 3D software for projects like the Cube in LA, because then I needed to build how to make this three meter by three meter cube with 40 different pieces. So I was not going to just to start building 40 pieces of concrete without having a very clear determination on how to do it. So it's a little bit of, 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 of the mold. And then we have the question on uh, how, once uh, you have more than one gallery, how do you organize what to give to which gallery? 
Okay. I don't know if you we want to be ve we want to be very transparent here, you know? It says no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, actually, actually, it's a very organic process. Uh, I like to think that I go along as galleries request for certain works that need to be for a certain uh, art fair, or then when you have a show at the gallery, obviously all that work stays as part of the gallery inventory. So I I, I say I like try to be very fair. And just actually, I wait for the galleries to be asking for what they need, and I try to keep them all happy. But obviously, working with different galleries is like having uh, more than one wife. <laughs> okay, I, I appreciate you, this. You need to keep them all happy. <laughs> uh, uh, I appreciate this comparison. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we close with this comment. <laughs> so it's not a question, but a comment. I thank you so much, Rosé. Oh, and there was another question regarding the open call. <laughs> um, it was this morning, 10 a.m., but we're going to do it again, I think. Uh, on, I don't know, but we're going to announce it. And we're going to do one at 10 a.m. in Los Angeles time, which I think you are at the same time with L.A., no? I'm uh, two hours away. Two hours uh, away. But sometimes it's two hours, sometimes it's only one. Yes. And so how long are you going to stay, stay there in the mountains now? I have to say, well, I think I'm going to stay until the 30th of April, like for one month. I'm yeah. setting up myself a little studio, like a studio where I can sketch, read and write. And, and then I think I'm going back at, at the end of April, I'm going back to, to my hometown. And then I'm, I'm really looking forward to going back to the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, with all the ideas I'm going to be developing here. Cool. Thank you. Stay healthy. I think uh, I have to agree with you, Johan, that it's a good idea to, to have this connection, to have this, uh, it's a good way of communicating. Yeah, absolutely. We stay, we have to be united around the world. Yeah. Okay. Stay, stay safe, Jose, and uh, keep the yes. good faith up. Ciao, everybody. You too.